So let's do Cinderella. The okay. chucklesome Kenneth Branagh came on the programme uh, last week and absolutely chuckled his way into the nation's hearts. Uh, he has uh, directed the new version of Cinderella, which is uh, based on Disney properties and also the Charles Perrault fairy tale, which is the most brilliantly legally... 1654 or something like that? Yeah, yeah but the Disney properties, I think, don't date back quite so. So it was, as you quite rightly said, it's, you know, it, it, on one level, it is a remake of the 1950 cartoon, and it, to which it, you know... With no songs, though, no songs. No, no songs, although I, there were moments when I did expect her to, you know, to burst into songs. So the story, I think we don't have to rehearse. It's all, you know, very well known. Uh, Cinderella, you know, step stepmother, stepsisters, they're terrible. Uh, you know, she can't go to the ball. However, there are some differences. The, f the most significant one being that the first time she meets the prince, she meets him on neutral ground and doesn't realise that he is a prince. In fact, she thinks that he is an apprentice, which is how he describes himself, because therefore he's an apprentice king. Uh, she then wants to go to the ball, but she can't go to the ball. She is told to stay at home and uh, mind the fire until, what do you know, Helena Bonham Carter turns up as her fairy godmother. Here's a clip. In you get. Oh, it's a lovely blue. Do stop whiffing on. I almost forgot. Remember, the magic will only last so long. With the last echo of the last bell, at the last stroke of midnight, the spell will be broken, and all will return to what it was before. Midnight. Hmm? Midnight. That's more than enough time. <laughs> Off you go, then. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Goosey, go! That's a moment yeah. where they could have burst into song. Yeah, and that surging score by Patrick Doyle really does. You know, it is. It's fulsome. It's fulsome and orchestral, and, it's, and, it, and it does all the surging in the melodrama that you want. So what's interesting about this, when this was first announced, uh, I mean, back in 2010, an Alien Brush began a script, and then to that was attached Mark Romanek, who was the director of Never Let Me Go, and they talked about taking the story in a dark way, and then apparently that wasn't what Disney were looking for, so they parted company. On came Kenneth Branagh, a rewrite by Chris Weitz, who is now uh, credited as the screenwriter. And... What what we have is almost radical in its refusal to be revisionist. You know, in a world, in a sort of post-enchanted world, in which the, the the fashionable thing now, and it's been fun, is to take fairy tales and take them apart in a postmodern way. So in the case of, you know, uh, of enchanted, it's uh, a fairy princess at large in the modern world. In the case of Into the Woods, which you loved so much, it's taking all those uh, fairy stories, I mean, they're obviously based on a musical, taking all those fairy stories and taking them apart. Actually, there's no happy ever after. What happens after these characters meet their princes? Well, actually, everything goes uh, horribly wrong. Or something like Maleficent, in which you know it's kind of undoing the the the, the story that you already know of the of the fairy tales. And what this does, it says, no, you know those fairy tales that you know. It's like that. There are certain concessions that have been made. As I said, uh, on, you know, on the one hand, the story's been changed slightly. So it, what happens in the case of Cinderella is that the way she meets the prince is slightly different. And there has been some criticism. You brought this up yourself uh, with uh, Ken Branagh that they said that uh, in, in the shape of Lily James, what we have with Cinderella, an old fashioned, you know, bad role model princess, you know, some thin waist. And there was a story about, you know, liquid diets and blah, blah, blah. But actually, she's far more independent than her critics have given her credit for. You know, firstly, she lives by the motto, which is to, uh, to be kind and have courage. And she does have kindness and indeed courage. She is, uh, you know, she's not impressed by riches. The first time she meets the prince, she doesn't know he's the prince. She he thinks he's on a par with her. She's uh, fairly fearless. She outruns the royal hunt in defence of a stag who, you know, is a is a friend of hers. And uh, she, you know, she is not somebody who is just reacting to the situation around her. So although I, although I, you know, I understand where that criticism came from, I don't think it has much strength. I didn't look at her and think actually what she is is a whimpering, simpering person waiting for magic to happen to her, although the story, of course, does have all the magical trappings. So that wasn't a problem for me. What I found myself doing was being swept up in the sort of the innocent beauty of it. I mean, I thought the Dante Ferretti sets were terrific. I thought the Sandy Powell costumes were, you know, eye-catching fairy tale stuff. And the whole thing 
is directed with... I mean, we know that Branner is, you know, is, is a fine director. I mean, he's dealt with fantasy many times before. Obviously, he dealt, you know, made the Thor movie, which I think he did a terrific job considering the the, the source material is not perhaps one of the best uh, comic strip sources. Um, I thought he did a great job of Frankenstein, which he got kicked all around town for. And I will, you know, I will always love Kenneth Branagh for the fact that he was the person who told all those stories about going on the world tour for Frankenstein and meeting Danish journalists who went, so this is the worst film ever made. How do you feel? Your career is completely finished. And he's able to laugh at then he also made the magic flute which was lovely but nobody saw at all so he does understand how to do fantasy and as he was saying when he was here it's peculiar that he actually has a he has a handle on special effects which you know somebody who started out being you know, the great shakespearean director the person who was you know it was all to do with theater when he did that fantastic uh 70 or 65 millimeter hamlet for example it was all about how he was the great theater director come to him but he absolutely understands the magic of cinema. I think that Kate Blanchett's performance as the um, as the wicked stepmother is more nuanced than some people have said. Some people have said she's classic 40s femme fatale, absolutely heart of ice. But in fact, she's more than that because you there are there is there are specific scenes in which you learn about you know why is she so mean? Well, you know, two marriages lost both husbands, creating great financial problems for her daughters who she kind of accepts are useless and she's worried about what's going to happen to them so yes there is jealousy but there is more than that it's kind of contextualized jealousy so even even she is given some kind of context for how she's arrived at the position that she's in so i thought the film was it did something which i was quite surprised by i mean it's it's as i said it's it is almost radically non-revisionist it is absolutely in love with the original fairy tale and some people have chosen to take that as a problem said that it's a throwback that she doesn't have the kind of you know the the the, the courageous chops of the heroines of brave or perhaps even frozen and you know you as we know the frozen fever short opens the movie which kind of tells you something about the target audience though honestly as we can see from frozen the target audience is uh, everybody ever but I thought it was kind of charming and, and kind of sweet and I liked it and I, I thought there were, there were moments in it. The ball scene, the ball scene is, is ravishing. It is probably like an old sort of, you know, choreographed cameras in the way of those old classic Hollywood musicals. And I thought it had charm to spare.